everybody. Uh, my name is Kola Ashiro Balogu. I'm the managing director of um, Mixta Real Estate PLC. Uh, we're just going to wait uh, like one or two more minutes just for um, everyone else to join the call. And then we'll start this uh, immediately. Yes, good morning. Thank you, sir. All right, good morning once again. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, this uh, webinar session uh, titled Making Informed Investment Decisions in the COVID-19 Era. Uh, we're looking at this purely from a real estate perspective. Um, this morning, we have a, a group of uh, panelists that are on the call that will be uh, providing guidance in terms of uh, the types of uh, decisions that we would make over the next uh, few months as we go through, uh, through this uh, I'll just go through um, uh, kind of like a welcome address um, to uh, set guidance or to set the stage, uh, to set the stage and the ball rolling for the event. After which, uh, we would uh, get a presentation from uh, my colleagues at the NRM on the economy as a whole. Then after that, we would um, go through the panel discussions. Um, late last year, and if you don't mind, um, at some point I might have to disable my video because of. Uh, late last year, I got my budget for 2020 approved by, by my board, which uh, clearly defined uh, my strategies for tackling the upcoming challenges in 2020. Never did I know or could I imagine that a single event which we failed to pay attention to could cause such a structural dis disruption to the global economy. It has only been a few months into 2020, even though we all just uh, wish the year was over. But I think it's important to recap what has happened so far this year. In ending February uh, this year, we had, just, we had just gotten over the extended Valentine promo period, which seemed much more exaggerated this year because of a very slow and dull uh, January. We all argued that a devaluation of the Naira was likely, but could not agree on when. The CBN governor tried his best to give investors confidence that the devaluation was very unlikely. Most of us did not agree with him, he said that for as long as reserves were around $38 billion and all was trading at above $50 per barrel, we would have sufficient firepower to fight devaluation. All as of, as of yesterday traded around $21 per barrel, and our reserves have since dropped to about $35 billion as of the end of March. The Naira, as we all know, has since been devalued to about $380 uh, to a dollar. And the question is, would, would there be another round yet again? The central bank also decided to take advantage um, of, to challenge the high interest rates uh, by cutting rates early in January. For years, most investors had sought investment shelter in treasury bills, uh, which were yielding over 13% per annum. This changed overnight. Suddenly, banks once again started lending aggressively. Uh, we all received uh, messages, notes, and alerts from banks asking us to take salary, salary advances 
and the different set of uh, loan instruments. All of a sudden, uh, real estate became more attractive uh, as rental yields, which have historically been below treasury rates, were of interest to investors. For those of us that were active in the capital markets, we beat our fingers as we saw rates drop to levels we couldn't have imagined late last year. Some of us took advantage of the market and issued commercial papers at almost 9% lower than what we were used to. Sales instantly picked up and I was confident that my company would surpass its Q1 projections. I was looking forward to the board meeting uh, for the first time and, and this was until the COVID-19 hit us in early March. That virus that we had thought uh, that would never affect Blacks or Africans was now in Lagos. Things have since changed to levels we could have never imagined since then. We're working from home now. Um, we're having a Zoom webinar. Uh, these are things that I could have never imagined uh, months or uh, some few months ago. So what would the next few months be like? What would property, would property prices drop? Are we in a recession? Is it a good time to invest? When would the economy recover? What will the government do? What can the government do? These are some of the questions we've received from our retail and institutional clients over the past uh, one or two months. Uh, from, our, from our perspective, um, we believe uh, real estate is a very, is a cyclical investment that in the long run would pan out better than equity and other investment instruments. But we thought it's better to put together a panel of um, experts that can share their experiences and bring light to this. Certainly, um, there's going to be a new normal post this crisis that will be filled with new opportunities and it's important that we all learn from experts to, on how to position ourselves to uh, gain the best from these opportunities. To kickstart the session today, uh, we thought it, like I mentioned before, we thought it would be ideal uh, for our research team at ARM. Um, ARM owns Mixed Africa, and we want them to share their insights into the economy. Afterwards, we'll go through a series of questions with the panelists, and then uh, we can take some Q&As from the audience before I come back to wrap up. Uh, just some home, uh, home rules. We've disabled the audio and video features for this webinar so that we can minimize uh, disruptions. We ask participants to please use the uh, Q&A buttons at the uh, bottom or the left side of their screens, depending on the system they're using. Uh, some of our panelists may also disable their videos as we go along to minimize any connection issues. So let's start. Uh, my colleague, Olamide uh, from ARM, will take us through our presentation on the economy. Thank you, Kona. Um, good morning once again. Um, my name is Ola Midi, and I'll just quickly give you the view on what we expect for the economic key macros, as well as what our market outlook will be going forward. Um, starting um, with the crude oil markets, um, we've seen um, a lot of a lot of volatility in the markets. Um, U.S. crude actually went below twenty dollars per barrel. Um, it went below zero. Um, our Brent, Brent went below $20 per barrel some days back. It's come back again to $21 per barrel. And it's basically just been an issue of demand. There's no demand. A lot of factories are closed. Um, those that are producing, they're unable to get buyers, you know, to pick up some of the crude that is available in the markets. Even with the OPEC cut that has happened so far, it's not sufficient. So it's not a case of supply now. It's a case of demand. Nobody's um, demanding for this crude because there is no production happening. And hence the reason why we've seen that volatility in the markets. For average for Q1, we did about $50 per barrel. What we think will happen over the rest of the year is um, like, we've, like we've seen so far, reports on vaccine, it looks more like nothing is going to happen as far as um, the vaccine is concerned this year. Um, the prospect is for us to have a vaccine by next year. But for most economists, they, they, they think that most analysts have come out saying that they think the coronavirus, the, the pandemic will remain. We probably just have situations where you try to manage um, things like social distancing to manage the situation, or we don't expect the vaccine to be released this year. And in light of that, it means that um, you will not see economic activities remain the way it used to be. And what that means is um, global demand will still be threatened and just tells you the direction for crude oil prices. So we think crude oil prices will remain low all through this year. Um, in terms of what we expect for our GDP, we did 2.3% in 2019. Um, over Q1, we've not released the numbers. So um, for Q, um, January and February, things would have still been good. The lockdown started as at um, end of March and a lot of things started slowing down from March. So 
I would think Q1, you might still record a positive growth, but from Q2, you definitely start to see, you know, a contraction in growth and it will come from both your oil sector. So we've seen a lot of reports show that the government is struggling to actually sell its product at its products. At some point, they had to start selling at a discount, you know, in order to be able to this, um, this, to dispose what they have at the moment. Also, recent um, discussion by the NNPC MD um, has come out to say that based on the issues they're having with selling, um, there might be a halt to production in, you know, going forward. But right now, they're still doing everything they can to make sure they're selling. It's just to tell you how the country is actually struggling, you know, based on this global pandemic. And the way the, the economy works, our key product is oil. So you definitely expect the fact that we're not going to get enough receipts to filter into the non-oil sector. So you can expect key slowdown, you know, across um, various non-oil sector. Um, I agree, a lot of this northerners, the virus has actually also moved here. And you might actually, so instead of just having a lockdown in just Lagos, Abuja, and Ogun, you might see it actually, you know, extend beyond these three states because it's spreading, you know, rapidly. And what that means is people won't be able to, you know, produce like they were producing before, and then you can expect a contraction. Um, the best case scenario is that we have a contraction for Q2 and Q3, and then things come back up in Q4. But it's most likely, what we think would happen this year, most likely, um, there's a tendency for us to still contract in, Q, in Q4, being that um, it takes us a longer time for us to come out of, um, you know, a contraction in growth and all. And we think that um, you could actually see the prospects, as a higher prospect of a recession this year. On a fiscal deficit, um, the case is very clear. I already said that we're struggling in terms of production of, um, in, ter in terms of selling what we produce, that's the crude oil, um, as well as the prices are also extremely low. So that tells you that our key source of revenue into the country is extremely low at the moment. And the expenditure remains sticky in that the recurrent expenditure, you know, which accounts for the large chunk of what the FG's expenses is, 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 is not going down. You have to pay some of your obligations, you have to pay salaries, um, I mean, they might decide they won't pay some and they'll pay some, but the fact remains that your recurrent expenditure is still very high. We don't think they'll be able to do any capital expenditure based on what is going on right now. And what all, all of this just tells us is their fiscal deficits will definitely be larger than what they projected. They're projecting um, around $2 billion, $2 trillion, sorry, in terms of the deficits, but you can be sure that that would definitely be higher, you know, for 2020. Uh, going on to currency, uh, it's still clear that they already um, did a technical devaluation uh, based on the fact that they are struggling to um, portfolio flows. If you um, try to look at the data, portfolio flows into the country has slowed significantly. You know, it has contracted. You're not getting interest in the country just due to the fact that there are reserves are extremely low at the moment, as well as um, the the source of income or the source of revenue into those reserves is actually drying up and there's a tendency that our reserves will, our expectation right now is our reserves will actually go way it will go below the 30 billion dollars that the cbn has said they were comfortable with so which just tells you that the risk to currency is very high at the moment um depends it depends on how long this um, pandemic goes on but there's a there's a very high probability that if it goes on for you know for the next six nine months you could see um another devaluation you know in the naira for inflation, uh, inflation for the first quarter, it's um, on the average for the last number that they released, it went up to 12.26. So on the average, you have between 11 and 12. And then what we think will happen for full year is inflation will definitely be higher relative to 2019. 2019, it printed an average of 11.4 percent was what we did in 2019. Um, but now, so there's people able to ask some of the product or the food produce they were able to get before. So there's been an try to reduce petrol uh, petrol price as well as um delay the increase in tariff. But we think the other things that have happened, which is the devaluation in naira as well as the increase, the artificial increase in food prices, will definitely still drive inflation higher for this year. So um, we're looking at inflation going close to about 13%, you know, for 2020, based on the dynamics that we've seen so far. In terms of monetary policy rates, uh, what we've seen is it's literally been flat. It's become um, just a figurehead so far. Um, they try as much as 
possible not to move it. Um, and uh, what we think will happen this year is they would, uh, they would definitely, the downside to where the rate is is very low. What you will see is um, best case is they will leave it at where it is just because there are FX concerns. Like I said earlier on, um, portfolio investors or foreign portfolio investors are not bringing in money into the country, which is one of you cannot take low because you don't want to you don't want to discourage it entirely. So you have to either you know leave it stable um, or increase it. Increasing it will mean that it will be counterproductive, being that the economy is already struggling, you're already um, stifling the banks worse. So that just tells you that um, early remain low. Um, moving on to the next slide. So um, we'll be talking about our market expectations, what we think will happen for key markets over 2020. Um, for equity markets, um, we've seen the downturn uh, where the market has significantly, significantly lost over, um, Q, over this last month in March. Um, the market dropped significantly. And that's due to the, you know, the risk the risk of where a lot of investors foreign investors have been selling off their assets you know a lot of if you look at us a lot of investors are going to the safe haven assets which is the dollar investments um the us fg the treasuries that's what you're finding investors going into so we've seen a lot of sell-off um the fact that there's weak economic outlook like i said there's a very high possibility that the economy actually you know goes into a recession this year. There's also the concern of lower credit prices, um, threat to production, as well as um, a further currency devaluation. So that just tells you that um, we see the market, the equity market, you know, going down this year. Um, but however, for us, we still believe that the market going down, it literally just presents, you know, some sort of opportunity. If you have um, like a long-term capital, not the short-term, because a lot of the stocks are trading really low at the moment. Um, but by and large, equities market performance will be very low. It will be down this year. For fixed income markets, um, there are a lot of moving parts to it. So like I said, the deficit is going to be way higher than the projected. Um, they are looking at getting some funds from, um, they're looking at getting some multilateral loans um, just to help survive during this period. But even at that, uh, we think the deficit, the the deficits we're looking at, we're looking at a deficit of about 4 trillion naira. And what that means is even if they get the facility from this multilateral loan, right now they still need approval, which means that there's some sort of delay. They need to meet their expenses over Q2, which they've not been able to. Um, the bond auction that happened yesterday, they literally had to take you know, higher than they said they were going to borrow. And that tells you that the government is actually pressed to borrow more funds. Um, getting the, the multilateral loan can help them in terms of not increasing rates. Um, but the best is we don't think you will see rates really go low from where they are right now. You will probably see it at you know similar levels, except they get more support funds um, that might be able to help. But um, in terms of rates going way lower than where they are right now, we don't see that happening. With the major major dynamic being the fact that they have this large deficit, you know, which is going to definitely exceed what they had planned before. For the real estate segment, um, it's been contracting for a while. Um, we, it, the contraction has actually slowed. You know, as of 2019, we saw the contraction actually slow down. When we, we felt before the coronavirus pandemic happened, um, we thought we could actually see, you know, some positive um, sentiment from that this year. But based on what has happened so far, um, we think you will find a slowdown in investment, you know, from both the FG um, as well as the private um, sector because consumer income will definitely depress this period. Um, then onto the triggers, what we think will be the triggers for 2020 that could cause, you know, having given our outlook for key, um, for the markets, what we think could be a trigger for the economy um, for this year is if we get the multilateral assistance, like I mentioned, where we're expecting to get about $6.9 billion, we're yet to get the approval of that. So that could help with the reserves. Um, also, if price, if the pandemic ends and prices go higher, crude oil prices go higher from where they are, then yes, um, you could see the whole outlook we've given concerning the market. You could see, uh, see that actually retrace. 
um, for the equity market is also clear. Um, increased economic activity would mean that you would see people, you know, come back for equities. Um, higher crude oil prices too would help with that. For the fixed income, for the fixed income, they already revised the crude oil price to about thirty dollars. The benchmark now is about thirty dollars. Um, it's already about thirty dollars, but um, an increase in crude oil prices means that. So I already said that the deficit was going to expand, but in a case where buy crude oil prices actually go higher, it means they'll be in a better position. I would not have to borrow, so that could, you know, ch um, change the outlook for most of the markets. But right now, from the look of things, from where we stand, um, it seems most uh, markets would actually be down, you know, this year. Now we move on to the next slide. Um, what we think you should be doing, you know, it's there's a lot of uncertainty going on. There's a lot of G3 movement. You're not sure what to do. Should you hold cash? Should you invest in real estate? Should you invest in equities? Should you go ahead to fixed income? And we think there are key things, there are essential things you should be looking at if you're going to, before you make your decision on investment, on whatever investment you're going to pick. Um, you should know that in this period, you need to be very strategic. You need to be focused on your long-term goal and there needs to be some sort of discipline to what you're trying to achieve. So um, rather than reacting, you know, um, based on what you can see, it would be good to be proactive in that, how do I prepare myself for, so the economy is down at the moment, what should I be doing? Where should I put my money? And then how do I prepare myself, you know, to be in a better position once this thing starts to die down? And we think the essential things, the essential questions and things you should be looking at is your risk tolerance. Um, that would help to determine the kind of investment you should be looking at. Your liquidity needs to, so um, if you have immediate cash liquidity needs, if you have liabilities that you need to pay up, things like school fees, things like health um, needs that you need to meet up in short term, and you know there are things you need to consider. And if you have, if you do not have immediate liquidity needs, if you still have long term capital, we will tell you the kind of investment you should be looking at. And also, your investment objective is key. You know, what are you trying to achieve in the long term? Where exactly do you, what kind of capital do you want to have at the end of the day? And if you're able to tell that, then you can tell the kind of investments class you should be putting your money in, despite all of the things we expect for this year. Your asset liability match is also very key. You, um, you state out the expenses you have over the next one or two years, as well as your assets. You definitely, we already know we need to have higher assets than our liabilities. So if you're not going to even have higher assets than your liability, there needs to be a match, you know, such that you're able to meet whatever liability that will come on board. So we think these are like the key, the key essentials that we, you need to ask yourselves in this period before making any investment decision so as to be in a very um, appropriate po um, position once this pandemic is over or to ensure that while it's still going on, you're properly placed, you know, to maximize the opportunities that are presenting themselves in this market at this moment. Um, thank you very, very much. I would hand over to Kola. Alamde, thank you very much for um, a, a very detailed uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's, we all agree that it's, it's kind of like a gloomy uh, outlook. Um, uh, I need clarity, and if this are the discussions we would have, we need clarity on whether it's a recession. Um, you said the equity markets are very more or less going to continue going downwards. Devaluation is of key concern. Uh, is it going to happen again? Uh, rates wouldn't change. Uh, they're not going to go lower. So these are very interesting. Uh, these are very interesting times for everybody. Um, I think we can move over to our panelists uh, today. Um, again, we thank all the. I think we have over uh, 400 participants that have joined us today, um, and um, we thank you all for joining. Uh, if you have questions, uh, sorry, 300 uh, participants. If you have questions, we we advise that you should please uh, just uh, send in your questions, type in your questions through the. Uh, Q&A box. Uh, today we have a very exciting uh, uh, in a set of individuals that will be walking us through this session. Uh, the, the first person uh, is uh, architect Ahmed uh, Gangiwa. Uh, he's the managing director and the CEO of the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria. We'll be hearing from, his, from him and his insights on um, 
what the what the bank plans to do uh, post COVID and how, if at all this pandemic would affect uh, their capability to continue to issue mortgages, especially through uh, their famous loyal to the National Housing Fund. Dr. Temi Tokbe Oshikoya is the um, Chief Economic Strategist of uh, Next Women's Limited. He's a seasoned economist, a policy analyst, and a chartered banker. Mr. Daudu, Jamil Daudu, is the Managing Director of uh, uh, CBRE Accelerate, uh, the full service real estate fund, and they advise clients, uh, corporate and uh, retail clients across Africa. Uh, Mrs. Udo Okunjo is the CEO and the Vice Chairman of Fine and Country West Africa. She's an astute uh, real estate entrepreneur, an international lawyer, and um, our firm specializes in, um, in you know, real estate investment management for HNIs and several other, and they provide several other services. Mr. Chinua Zubike is the MD, Managing Director and CEO of InfraCredit. The company provides local currency guarantees to enhance uh, credit quality of debt instruments to finance uh, infrastructure projects within Africa. Uh, Chino has uh, worked uh, with several uh, key initiatives on uh, debt financing over the past few years, so it also shares insights on what to expect. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Uh, Chukunonso Onyeze, uh, the CEO of my sister, Sarah, So I'll go over to the questions. Uh, I have a couple of questions here that I will start with. Um, Dr. Ashikoya, um, I'm going to start with you if you don't mind. Um, the IMF in its regional economic outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa projects a 3.4% uh, contraction of the Nigerian economy this year due to the part of the uh, decline in commodity prices, we all know, particularly oil. What does this mean for local businesses in layman's terms? You have to unmute the uh, the mic. Um, can the host help uh, unmute all the panelists' mics, yes? Yes, we can hear you now, sir. Dr. Shikoya. Yes. We can hear you. Um, my question to you uh, was the IMF uh, just, to re just to repeat my question, um, the IMF, again, um, in its regional, regional economic outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa, projects a 3.4% contraction of the Nigerian economy this year. This is in due to the sharp decline in commodity prices, especially oil. What does this mean for local businesses in layman's terms? Okay, thank you very much. I think you addressed an issue earlier on that are we going to be in a recession or not? Definitely the answer is categorically yes. We are going to be in a recession. And with 3.4%, um, minus 3.4% that is being projected by the IMF, it says basically it shows that you're going to be in a recession. What is the impact of this for, for, for local businesses? First, you see that if you look at the component of GDP, uh, as the earlier presenter uh, made on the economy, you are going to have um, decrease in export due to decrease in prices of oil and, um, uh, and oil production, which will affect consumption, uh, consumption per capita, which will also affect uh, investment in terms of uh, such, um, uh, uncertainty is affecting investment, as well as importation of raw materials for manufacturers, for example, will also be significantly affected because if you don't have the foreign exchange, uh, the implication is that you don't have the, the, um, the ability to source uh, uh, foreign uh, imported raw materials. So local businesses are going to have, be affected through those different channels. That uh, There is going to be a decrease in demand uh, for their products. There is going to be a um, decrease in investment. They are likely going to react by doing what? By trying to uh, conserve capital. 
because they have, have the issue of uh, liquidity versus insolvency. Uh, and in order to remain insolvent, to remain solvent, they probably want to preserve their capital, uh, preserve cash. In essence, cash is king at this point in time. And as a result, it's more likely that they will probably cut down on uh, employment, uh, with the implication that employment is likely going to rise. And um, as a result, uh, it's extremely important that, um, you know, uh, as been done in places like uh, the Western countries, we need to come up with palliatives that will help um, local businesses. And when we are talking about local businesses, because we are an economy which is at least uh, more than 50% an informal economy, it's more likely that you know um, the, the, the informal sector will be significantly affected because they essentially operate on a daily basis. They generate their cash on a daily basis. And um, without, with this lockdown, for example, it's, it's, it's going to, to be extremely difficult to be able to generate cash on a daily basis. So both the corporate and the, and the informal sector are going to be impacted significantly because of this coronavirus and already being affected, actually. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, that's quite interesting. Um, we all know that cash is always king. Um, uh, we know uh, unemployment, uh, we hear that unemployment is raised. It's quite, um, it's quite, it's quite uh, concerning. Um, I think there was a recent McKinsey report that uh, they issued, uh, they mentioned uh, Africa as a whole would uh, lose about, uh, about 18 million jobs uh, due to this pandemic. Um, and, you know, 18 million jobs out of the uh, 100 and something uh, jobs in the in Africa as a whole. So it's quite, it's, it's something that is going to be quite severe. Um, Olamide, um, again, I know Dr. Shikraya is, is adamant that um, uh, this is a recession. You know, I, I think we're always uh, very careful in determining whether we're in a recession or not. Um, you know, other analysts define a recession as uh, a number of um, negative growths and a number of uh, quarters over a period of time. Uh, can you answer authoritatively, are we in a recession? If not, um, do you, when do you see us entering that recession? Or even worse, are we going to go into a depression? Okay, um, thank you, Kola. So for Nigeria's case, um, I mean, the definition for a recession remains the same. It's typically um, two quarters of negative growth. Um, but in, for Nigeria's situation, it's been a case of pre, between where we're coming from and where we are at the moment. And the reason why there's a lot of argument to say that we are already in a recession, right? And what typically happened is between 20, 2005, I'll just track back a bit just to give a context to why um, you could see a lot of analysts already, you know, saying that Nigeria, as far as they're concerned, Nigeria is already in a recession. Between 25, 2005 and 2010, we're recording growth of about 7 to 8%. Between the next five years, we went to about 5% average growth. And then, you know, the 2015, 2016 crisis where we actually, you know, we went into a recession, the economy contracted. But since then, we've not been able to return to where we're coming from. So on the average, we've still done, we did 1.9% growth at some point. Um, last year, we did, that's 2018. We did 0 0.8 in 2017. We went to 1.9 and then we did 2.3. So these three years or so after the recession, we've not been able to get back to just even the 5% level of growth and was supposed to be the giant of Africa. And if you compare it with other, you know, the other emerging countries, you find out that they are recording way better growth than the 2% we're recording. And it's the reason why you find a lot of argument to say that Nigeria is already in recession. But um, I mean, looking around, the, the definition of recession remains the same. So um, as to the fact if we're in recession or not, currently, no. But definitely the fact that we, we've not, we, our growth is still very disappointing is the reason why anyone would want to refer to us that we're in recession. But there's a very high chance, there's a very, very high probability that we're actually going to go into recession this year, you know, and it will now take, you know, a longer time for us to even get out of it. Um, depression in its definition. So I, I guess I, I just answered the question if we're in a recession or not. 
currently, no, we, we are not in a recession, but there's a high probability we will actually go into recession this year. Um, in terms of uh, depression, depression is actually, so instead of looking at quarterly contraction in growth, which is what recession looks at, the depression is actually, you know, looking at the definition, it's uh, looking at years of contraction, you know, so you have contraction in economic growth for a very long period of time. Now you're not even focusing on the quarterly numbers, you're looking at the annual decline in economic activity, you know, over a long period of time. That, at that point, we are already in, that is the definition of a depression. If Nigeria will go into depression, um, I don't think we will. I think what you would just have is what we've done in the last few, you know, in the last two years where growth will be extremely, you know, slow. It, it would be very low. It won't be as high as where we're coming from. And that's because our focus is still on the oil. We've still not looked at other parts that can help the economy. ICT, for instance... Um, Eva, as Eva, so if, if you don't mind uh, me asking, how long do you think this recession would be? Um, just from your own guesstimate, from your own perspective, is it something that will be in this deep for, uh, you know, you analysts use like an L curve, U curve, V curve. Um, is it, um, how long do you think it's, it's some few quarters, a year or two years or what? Well, from what it's we have right time. now, um, you can be certain that for the for this year, we are going to be in a recession. Um, by 2021, the, the tenor of the recession literally depends on the efforts the government actually takes post this pandemic. Now, if you're able to, you know, take measures put in policies that filter straight into the economy, it filters down into, you know, businesses that are able to grow and generate, you know, activities for the economy as a whole, then yes, we might be out of it, say, um, H2 next year. That's if they are able to actually put in the right policies in place that will get us back. But if not, then you might actually see this, you know, still continue in 2021. So U.S., for instance, the projection for U.S. so far is um, they'll contract this year. But again, because of the kind of um, policies they've tried to put in place, the um, monies they've tried to release to help businesses such that they are still um, surviving in this period. Um, recently, that was yesterday, they still uh, you know, app approved another $500 billion for small businesses to be able to still thrive, pay up their obligations in this period, you know, just to be able to help economic activities. So, I mean, that's a country that, is, that still has about $500 billion to release. And this is us that our whole reserves is just $34 billion. You know, it's less than, um, 30, um, it's around $30, $34 billion already. You know, $35, 34, $33 to $35 billion is where we are at the moment. And that just tells you that um, the measures we can put in place would be very, very important to help us to actually leave the recession you know, quick enough. But I think the earliest we can do, say we put the right measures in place, we we'll probably be, you know, going to, into the second half of 2021. Oh, All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shikoya, yeah. I, I assume that um, you yeah. agree, or do you think it's a, a gloomier picture than, than what Olamide has mentioned? Well, I don't know about depression, but I, if you look, who defines um, a recession? Uh, technically, it's defined by the U.S. National Bureau of Economic Research. And it's true, they used to use two quarters of um, uh, falling um, GDP growth rate. But of recent, after the um, uh, global financial crisis, they refined their methodology and realized that um, they are basically using lagging indicators that you can be in a recession before recession is actually, before the data comes out, before the data for GDP comes out. So in a place like the US where, for example, you have almost about um, uh, 20 million, indeed I think this week it's like going to have about 4.5 million people claiming unemployment, um, making unemployment claims. Last week it was 5.5 million. In essence, all the jobs that were created after the global financial crisis in the U.S., all of them have been lost. So the, the NBER doesn't need to wait for two quarters of GDP to know that there is a recession already going on. You understand? The same thing with Nigeria. The only thing is that in Nigeria, 
the, the National Bureau of Statistics has been trying its best. But we also know that those, the data they provide are not as um, accurate as say what will be provided in the US, neither are they as um, uh, current as what the US will provide. So even from anecdotal evidence, you know that the country is already in a recession. If, uh, if your informal sector constitutes half of your uh, activities, economic activities, and they are completely in a lockdown, they are not in any form of productive means. So I don't need to wait for two quarters of GDP to know that they were in a recession. As for a depression, I think, um, as Olamide said, she's right. It has to be uh, things like um, at least one year or, or multi-year uh, um, decline in GDP and so on. But if you, if you look at GDP per capita instead of GDP, you know that our GDP per capita has stagnated for, 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 for some time. So depending on indicators we are using, we are in a dire economic situation. Well, that's, uh, I think that's like, both uh, allude to the same fact that yes, when the recession, I well agree that it's going to last at least through, through, through uh, uh, H2 20, 2021. Uh, which is quite uh, difficult. But I think this also presents a significant amount of opportunities for investors, still and institutional investors out there. Um, and, you know, I, while I would like to continue the discussion on the economy, I think it's quite, um, I would like to go over to uh, more real estate, uh, which is the reason why we're here. Uh, Jamil, um, I'm going to, going to be asking you this question. Um, so we've all agreed that uh, uh, post COVID, we're going to go into a recession. Um, how do you see this affecting each of the subsectors of real estate, you know, from the commercial side to the uh, residential side and hospitality across the board? What do you see going on? Well, thank you, Kola. Um, you know, your question is almost similar to the same question people asked themselves in 2005, when we had the credit crunch crisis globally. And, you know, the first question you ask is, when there's a recession, there are opportunities that exist in a recession. And, and that's where you talk about the two segments of the market. Now, in any form of recession, you have the opportunities, the capitalists who are the cash buyers who come into the markets to buy um, properties that have lost or declined in value. Now, you've got to look at it in two sets. In the residential market, there'll be more opportunities there where a lot of investors can buy cheaper properties. When you now come to, when you look at it holistically, you know, like Olamide said and Dr. Shinoisa also said, is you've got to look at the objectives. Why are you acquiring these properties? And what's the time frame in which you're looking to make a return on those properties? Now, for people who are buying cheaper properties, is that they, they're buying it for the long term. They're not looking for an immediate return, and it's a cash buy. Now, so there, there'll be more opportunities like that in the residential market. But when you come to the commercial market, it's a completely different game, because then the kind of money you're talking about to buy these properties are a lot more than what you'd be spending in the, in the residential market. Now, with the commercial market, you either coming from a, pension, from a pension fund, or you're coming in as a private equity buyer, and you would require you know, debt to be, able to, buy, to be able to buy these properties. And the bigger question is return. So in any recession, is that your return declines, because it's a question about liquidity. And this is almost something we, we noticed in England in 2005, and took the United Kingdom almost about five, six years to come out of that recession to be able to get to where they are today. <clears throat> and we're going to see that happening. Now, we saw that happening come 2016, um, where a lot of investments in the commercial sector had developed a lot of grade A properties, hoping to make about $1,000 uh, per square meter on rent. And a lot of investors had to drop that 1,000 to about 750, say, for, for example, in Ikoi. Victoria Land dropped this about $650. Even with that, 
there was the take up space in the market was still very slow and we had a huge void period. Now COVID-19 has come in and has changed the whole dynamics of it. <clears throat> so we're going to see um, a further decline in, in rentals uh, across board because again, like the two panelists said, it's a question of demand. The supply is there, but the demand is going to decline because COVID-19 now has given, given a lot of occupiers different ways of how they can carry on their business. If somebody had told us two, three years ago that uh, a time will come when Nigeria will be doing everything online, having um, virtual meetings and people working from home, we will all say, no, that's impossible. We don't have the infrastructure. But here we are, we're all doing that. So come post COVID-19, we're going to see where companies are going to try and save costs in the sense that we're already seeing that as it is, is that people now want to contract the spaces in which they occupy, look at more conventional ways of working and see how they can cost costs. So there's going to be a huge um, unemployment that's going to happen over the next couple of months. It's already happening as we speak. And um, because companies are not producing anything, their P&Ls are declining. And that's going to have a severe impact on, on, on the property market. Now, as we say that, there's still opportunities in the market. The biggest people who are going to get the hit are the, uh, the investors who own the grade A buildings, where their rents are over $500 or $600 per square meter. That's going to have an impact because now everyone is going to realign how they think. So if you think about the way companies were in 2016 and they were looking at how their operations were going to be when we had the recession, this is going to be worse because this is not something that's just going to affect Nigeria. This is something that's affecting us globally. And this is something that's further reduced our liquidity in the sense that, I mean, we could use the word Nigeria might be broke because um, if you look at what Olamide said about the um, oil prices of crude, as at Sunday, you know, you're talking about 17 cents for the WTI uh, crude in the United States, which anybody who is going to be buying those contracts will have to pay the it happens to be about $37, which went into the negative. So if Nigeria at the moment is struggling to fund its 2020 budget as we speak today, and even giving discounts to their crude, um, even with the low values, it gives you a sense of worry, is that the biggest spender in the market is struggling to raise cash and to spend, which is the federal government. So, and that's going to have an impact on the commercial industry. But, in terms of residential, this is the opportunity where developers can look at more innovative ways of bringing out affordable housing and bringing out more cheaper products. But at the same time, it's still going to have a negative impact on, on all our balance sheets. It's not going to be business as usual. Um, I know um, Olamide said, you know, we're looking at about a year. In my view, I'm looking at a minimum of two years to get us back to where we are. Because even if the market picks up, you've got the perception of people have to change. And that's going to take a much longer. If the government comes out with policies, it takes at least a minimum of 12 months for, a, for the policy to trickle down the system. So even if we come out post-19, the government comes out with policies in Q3, Q4, that's going to take you the whole of 2021 for the policy to actually have, start having an effect in the market. So you're, you know, hypothetically, you're looking at a, a two-year minimum for us to even get back to where we want to be. And um, I think it's, we've got the gl more gloomy days ahead of us than, than we anticipated. And, and this is a problem that is expanding globally. So there will be a decline in returns uh, on the, in the commercial side. On the residential side, that's gonna be very subjective because people will be buying properties for various reasons. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jamil. Um, you know, the funny thing is that we, we, um, we take a position that um, all of us right now, um, and uh, the person that shared this with me, uh, was not even during this call today, none so. Um, she, she takes a position that all of us right now are home. Um, um, people, you know, whether you, you're staying at home, you're working from home, you're doing your webinars and everything from home. So it brings the importance of, of uh, residential real estate during this time. Uh, we remain quite uh, 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 bullish about uh, about that industry. Why? Because um, uh, yeah, it's a basic need. Um, so um, it's something that we see going forward. Um, it's still going to be high. It's going to be high in demand. 
uh, there's going to be opportunities for investors uh, to acquire residential uh, residential properties. Um, on the on the affordable side, um, it it depends on uh, what the government does. I, I think we've all said this uh, over over time. That we need support from the government. But what I'm hearing everybody say is that uh, there has to be some palliative measures uh, provided by the government. Um, and it's quite, it's quite interesting. I'm quite glad to have um, architect uh, Danjira with, with us today. Um, uh, we would like to uh, turn over to you and as we focus more um, into real estate now. Um, my question to you, sir, is that um, with all this going on, what is the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria um, doing to um, alleviate some of these issues that are, uh, that are ongoing? I uh, would like to know from your perspective, um, what the bank can do to its customers, what the bank can do to even new customers. Are you going to continue lending? Um, is this really affecting uh, the bank? Because um, I, I do understand that you have a significant amount of re uh, reserves to deploy. What is the Federal Mortgage Bank uh, doing right now, especially with products such as your national housing fund? Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, as uh, regards to your question, there are a lot of uncertainty quite well in terms of job and financial insecurity within the system due to the COVID, which we all know. Uh, some of our options, especially when a client could not be able to keep his monthly installment payment of his mortgage, is that we have started informal discussion myself and the Secretary General of the Nigeria Mortgage Bank Association of Nigeria, which is the umbrella body of mortgage uh, banks. As you quite well know, the NHF mortgage, which is uh, deployed by and by FMB and uh, through the primary mortgage banks, they are the ones that are intermediary between us and the, the off takers. So we have started discussing and uh, we'll continue the discussion, especially post, uh, post uh, COVID, to see how we can uh, leverage and see the amortize so three to six months more monetization of the interest and even the repayment so that we can have a free interest extendable up to a one year. Uh, this one we'll discuss with them and then we'll take it to our board, which we'll soon meet because we are supposed to meet just when the lockdown started in Abuja. So immediately after the opening of the lockdown, we are going to, our board is going to meet and then discuss that then we escalated to Mortgage Bank Association of Nigeria for that. So the client that have started meeting, uh, having this kind of problems, we advise them just to start discussing with the PMBs if there's any challenges they are facing. With regards to whether we can still provide mortgage loans, quite well, it's our core business, which we'll continue to do. And the contributors have an obligation over us to ensure that we get the loans when they apply. We'll continue to do that to stimulate the economic activity and create jobs uh, through our products. We have discussed last week with our minister, he invited us to see what uh, are you planning. And these are some of the planning that we have told them. And uh, I wish to tell you that uh, with our current moderate liquidity, I think uh, will certainly meet contributors' demands, especially after this uh, for uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic. And uh, as you quite all know, we are envisaging even a downfall or glut in the mortgage market, especially some of the houses, the prices have to fall down, and uh, that will increase affordability to some of our contributors in order to do that. Thank you very much, sir. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's glad I'm glad to hear that um, uh, the bank would be able to uh, meet this uh, liquidity demands, uh, especially from some new clients. Uh, we, you know, we had we've spoken severally in the past, and you know, from our perspective, we see that um, affordable housing is is one of the key pillars to solve in any economy. And you rightly agree, agree with this, um, and. Um, I, I just think it's, it's important that uh, the participants and everybody appreciates what's going on, especially with what NHF is, is able to provide. Uh, so again, I'll come back to you, sir, on other questions as we go along, because we're getting a lot more specific questions for NHF. Uh, Mr. Zubike, um, again, going, uh, discussing um, uh, regarding the government interventions and um, Actually, I would also like uh, architect Danjua to chime in on this. Uh, the CBN unveiled a, a raft of measures that address addressing the economic impact of uh, COVID-19. There's a stimulus package of about 5 trillion naira. 
Um, and so, and this is sorry, somebody's. Um, can you unmute my phone please? Because there's a uh, feedback. From your experience um, in development finance and with government-backed initiatives, in what ways can we expect these to in impact the average homeowner or prospective homeowner? Thank you, Kola. Um, Sorry, Chino, you, you might have to turn up your mic. Can you hear me better now? Can you hear me better now? A little bit louder, please. Okay. Can you, can you hear me be better now? Okay. So thank you, thank you, Kola. Um, I think, thank, thanks for, for having me on this, um, on this conference. Um, and I thank the earlier speakers. I think they shared a few lights that um, quite, quite interesting perspectives to bring to bear when we look at um, how interventions can happen. Uh, I think, you know, uh, um, Jamil did mention something that is very valid, which is with, with government intervention, the, the real question is around the transmission uh, mechanism. How long does it take uh, before we begin to see the impact? Um, the, 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 um, the, the series of um, solutions that have been provided are actually quite um, opportunistic. And I think as developers, it's, it's, it's actually a timely to look into how best um, the market can take advantage of, of, the, of the intervention, which is targeted at mortgages and also housing supply. Um, and and, if, it's, and if, the, if the institutional mechanism that is put in place, and this is what kind of structure is being put in place, what is the governance arrangement, and how do you ensure that you know, it, it actually gets to those who need it? Um, assuming all those are well put in place and implementation is executed timely, um, ideally, um, you should begin to see some of that impact in, 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 in stimulating market demand um, and also um, supply. However, I think from a practical standpoint, the question now would be, what is our outlook for recovery, right? Because, you know, this um, pandemic has created um, sort of social and psychological effect um, on people. So we're still on a lockdown. Um, we're seeing that these numbers, um, the cases are increasing. So when do we get out of lockdown? When do we restart the economy? And how do we begin to um, build confidence again in, within the market? So understanding how the recovery cycle will take place is also key in, in really being able to um, assess um, the ultimate impact of these interventions. Um, so I would say that, you know, again, um, to Dr. Shikoya's point, um, something we need to look into, <clears throat> and I think um, architect Dangiwa Dange Dange highlighted this, is around once we, if we understand, and, and just really, uh, again, it's, it's important for, for us to take informed, um, informed decision making alongside how we see the impact and over what time. And I think taking a view to understand that, you know, over the next six to nine months, for example, we would have a stress in the economy. All of this will be driven by the policy choices that the government make, and um, policy choices in terms of how they're able to restart the economy. Now, let's assume that the policy choices are, the, are actually the right policy choices that are driven by ensuring that the right decisions are taken around how the economy is restarted, how vaccines, um, whether or not we can control well how the vaccines will be, um, whether, when, when the vaccines will be found. So that means even after the lockdown, there would be some form of social distancing and, and, and some impact on, you know, on, 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 on businesses over time. Therefore, um, the question now would be, I mean, to the extent that, um, that this cycle is, is, is taking, so the informed decision making is understanding that timeline. And if we say a six to nine month timeline, then we can be strategic about it. Um, doc, um, doc, Dr. Shika talked about liquidity versus insolvency. I think we need to take a view about how we need to um, you know, support businesses um, support homeowners over a cycle. Because like you rightly said, um, you know, housing is an essentiality. Therefore, demand is typically inelastic. But right now, what we're dealing with is a psychological, social, and economic stress. And therefore, we need to take into consideration how long it will take for market confidence to build up. And therefore, you know, to a large extent, it creates, obviously, there is the, the opportunity over time once the market recovers. But between that period, that cycle, I think we need to be very strategic about how we ensure that we preserve value within that cycle. And preserving value is around ensuring that home buyers, and for those home buyers that have stress, that you can restructure and give them sufficient time to recover. For developers and also supply side, that may also be impacted. 
Now, maintaining that liquidity is critical. And how that is done is also very important. And in doing this, we're able to sustain the market enough for these interventions to be meaningful when they're implemented. So I think it's a good time. Um, I mean, the, the, the package is, you know, I think it's actually unprecedented um, that the CBN is coming up with, a, with an intervention for the housing market. I think historically there's always been um, a, an advocacy for the CBN to support the housing market. So, so it's a unique opportunity for the stakeholders in the market to ensure that the mechanism, which is what kind of structure um, is being put in place to ensure that it's meaningful and it happens. Um, it, it really depends on the actors in the market to ensure that that, that happens. But my, you know, to the point is we need to have a short-term plan whilst we have a medium term, because intervention would happen not in the short term, but in the medium term. In the short term, is really around ensuring that we can sustain existing um, you know, um, home buyers, um, existing businesses, provide the necessary liquidity, so that at the point where market begins to recover, um, there is sufficient um, um, capacity to scale and take advantage of the opportunity at that point in time. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks again, Chinua. Um... Uh, before I go over to uh, Mrs. Okonjo, um, architect Tanjira, I just have a quick question for you, and it's something uh, one of the participants just asked. I think it's always a, it's a recurring question. Uh, from our experience at Mixta, I think this is much in vogue. But um, the, the key question is the processing of NHF applications. Um, I know um, a lot of uh, people out there believe that it takes years or at least a year to process this. What is your institution doing about rectifying uh, this situation, especially during this uh, difficult time, such that uh, loan applicants can get their loans approved on time? Sorry, so your, your, your mic is on mute, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Uh, you're now on mute, sir. Please unmute your mic, sir. Uh, we can't hear you, sir. Yes, it's a body. Oh, this is, yes, this is better now, sir. We can hear you now, sir. I think we've uh, lost uh, architect Danjiwa there. I think he will join us, uh, he will be join the uh, webinar. So I'll just move over to uh, Mrs. Okonjo. Um, I, I know you're quite, I follow you a lot, uh, both on social media and um, I receive your emails. Uh, you have considerable experience in uh, real estate and the background that you have there, you know, is, is something that makes uh, your window on uh, real estate. Um, what are your thoughts on residential housing uh, post-COVID? Um, is, it, is, is it still a safe bet? Is this something uh, we should still continue co uh, to consider? And why do you think so? Uh, hi, thank you, Carla. I'm just trying to make sure. Um, can you hear me? If you let me know that you can hear me, then I'm fine. Yes. I'll just go yes, right back in. you very well, yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carla. So... Um, you know, I mean, all the speakers have really laid the uh, solid foundation for this conversation. So I'm, I'm going to try and sort of move us along in terms of where I see uh, real estate going in the future, uh, specifically with regards to the question you asked on residential. Uh, but before I focus on residential, I, I just want to share a few thoughts in terms of, you know, the way we're thinking and the way we've always thought about the real estate market, whether locally or globally. When we came into the market in, in, Afri in West Africa, uh, 2008, 2007, 2008, we were right in the middle of a recession. And in a sense, since then, we've gone through at least two local, two to three uh, local recessions, depending on who you're asking or who you're speaking to. So in a sense, you know, for us, we've always been focused on the, on the point of view of the marketplace, i.e. the consumers, the users um, of real estate. And so from that perspective, you know, we're looking and saying that um, there, is, there are always markets within markets. And it's our responsibility as real estate investors, real estate developers, um, you know, those on the supply side, to look at the current market, the current economy, and the current environment 
and realize that, you know, definitely as someone uh, referred, you know, said earlier, that we're in unusual times. So it is business unusual. And if it's business unusual, I think that one of the key things that we need to do is that we need to rethink. We need to go back to the drawing board. We need to reimagine and, you know, perhaps maybe throw out the old box. Um, because, you know, the way that we've been operating will not suffice for this new economy. Um, this new economy, as Azubike was, you know, uh, saying earlier, we have, you know, customers who are are psychologically stressed and stretched, you know, as far as their finances. Um, it's also unique in the sense that it's not just local, but it's also global. So it then means that, you know, as uh, real estate investors, we have to put, put on our thinking cap and begin to come up with new solutions um, and finding ways to, as it were, deal with the market because there will always be a need for real estate. Um, so it's for us to find out where those needs are and begin to tackle them. What I'd like to do is to use a framework that we are using and that I would suggest to, um, to, to real estate investors in terms of thinking about um, what the opportunities are and how to rethink um, what it is that we're doing and could be doing in this season. So I'm going to use what I refer to as the GDP framework. Now, not GDP in the way we typically know it, but I'm just going to go through very quickly. Um, so G in this case would refer to globalization. Now, when I talk about globalization, I'm talking that, you know, from a developer's point of view, from a supply side point of view, if we're looking to stimulate the market, bear in mind, I'm talking now post-COVID. During the times that we're in currently, yes, there are opportunities, but the fact of the matter is that we have to be sensitive to, uh, to our clients and to the market and recognize that those pockets of opportunities, while we continue to tap into them, at this particular time, our focus has to be really building client trust, managing the current uh, clients that we have, and making sure that we retain them and that we're sensitive to their needs and ensuring that we, we support them through these very difficult times. While we ourselves, as um, obviously you know, investors, suppliers, developers, work with the government to use uh, some of those interventions in a way that sustains our businesses during this time. So back to this concept of globalization, um, you know, it's really referring to more of expanding our market. Whereas most investors, most developers, and I keep referring to developers and investors uh, by way of, you know, I'm talking suppliers, I'm talking the landlords, but in this particular, um, you know, um, uh, the principles I'm sharing, I'm going to be focusing really mainly on the, on the residential market. So in terms of uh, looking at a more of a global market, I believe that the world has never been more global than it is. And I, su I, I suppose that what's going on currently brings us to that, uh, to that intersection where we see that even though countries are protecting themselves, but there's a sense in which we're all really connected. Obviously, we're using all these digital platforms to connect with people across the world. And, you know, we have nationalities across, you know, uh, various um, uh, territories and boundaries. And the marketplace also has expanded beyond, you know, our local environment. So with regards to, um, to the market, we need to start looking beyond our immediate markets, as it were, because the profile of the clients that we're looking for um, will need to go beyond what we're currently looking at. So, for example, a few years ago when we had the recession, what we did at, at Fine & Country was to, um, was to do what we refer to as taking Nigeria to the world. And, you know, our premise at that time was the fact that we have Nigerians, and this isn't a unique proposition. This is something that clearly has been supported by, you know, the, the Nigerian diaspora um, office from the presidency. And, you know, most developers took advantage of that platform that we provided a few years ago to tackle or to, to target um, Nigerians in diaspora. But what we found was that it wasn't just Nigerians in diaspora. We found that there were investors, and I believe it was Jamil uh, who referred to opportunistic investors. So we need to start rethinking that it's not just owner occupiers, the people who are here right down the road from us in Abuja or Lagos or Ibadan who are looking to buy these properties, but that people basically are going to be looking all over for where the opportunities. Indeed, in, uh, every time there's a recession, and even in the last few weeks, we've seen an increase in inquiries for uh, what I've referred to as um, opportunistic um, uh, real estate, you know, both locally and internationally. So I feel that currently and post COVID, we need to expand our view of our marketplace. And that's what I refer to as globalization. The second one I would move very quickly is the D, which would I would look at uh, digital platforms or digitalizing um, you know, our real estate offerings. And you know, 
from that perspective, beyond the technology, I'm basically referring to how can we use digital platforms or uh, the digital uh, framework to provide convenience to our clients. You know, so for example, do clients really need to come to your site if they are in Hong Kong or in America or in the UK or in Ghana and they want to see your, your property, do they need to come physically? To what extent are we using technology to fast track these transactions? To what extent are we using technology to enhance the customer um, experience and the customer engagement? To what extent are we using technology to expand even the market? And certainly in the, in the, in the new world, uh, customers are going to be very mindful of um, you know, suppliers or developers or, uh, or investors who are mindful of their time and who are providing a more convenient way of, as it were, engaging with them, especially as you know, a few of the speakers have spoken, that this question of social distancing is something that is here to stay, at least in the foreseeable future. So I believe that as investors, it's important that we begin to think about this new world and how we adapt the way we're doing business to ensure that we're able to still tap into the opportunities. Definitely the opportunities will be fewer, but we can actually expand them if we can use this framework to approach these opportunities. The final one and the third aspect of the framework is the P, and, and with that, I refer to the product. So which would be you know, productizing our offerings as it were. And um, the, the way I, I would approach it and the way we approach it at finding countries to then say, how do we begin to adapt these real estate uh, offerings in a way that suits the new profile that will emerge? In a sense, if we go back to you know, expanding the customer base, there's a sense in which we're constantly thinking, okay, the immediate investor who wants to buy one property or the owner occupier who is looking for a first home or maybe a second home because they're moving up uh, the real estate ladder. But it's, it's, um, it's important that we begin to think a bit more expansively. So for example, collaborative investors, right? So we're talking uh, pools of investors who come together to invest into a real estate, into a piece of, uh, uh, into a property. How are we, as it were, adapting our, our properties or our real estate offerings in a way that we can tap into that market? Because as affordability is an issue, um, it, it's, it doesn't mean that people will not be interested in real estate. They have to be interested in real estate. Because if you think that in Nigeria, we have a less than 25% um, home ownership penetration, which means that close to 80% of Nigerian adults actually rent the properties that they live in. That in itself presents a humongous opportunity in the residential space. And it's investors who will provide those properties. The government is not in a position to provide real estate in terms of residential properties for people to rent. It's private investors that provide and fill that gap. But the question is, we can't think the way we've been thinking in the past. We have to start creating products. And by products, I don't necessarily mean the, the property itself, but the way the property is presented. If I were to come to you now as an investor and I say, oh, I have a pool of 10 people. Has your company thought through the modalities, for example, with working with those types of investors? Um, in future, also, we're going to see a lot of high density properties. We're going to see much smaller properties. So the product itself needs to start being also re-engineered to meet the new marketplace that we're going to see. What about the profiles as far as, um, you know, we're talking millennials, for example. What about, you know, the old, the, the aged, as it were? So the new economy, we need to start rethinking it and start looking for uh, the opportunities that exist there so that we're not camped out you know, in is, is essentially the same old things and the same old products. Most of the uh, questions we get um, at Finding Country West Africa is usually around, you know, lots of properties that are hanging around in, on the island, Ikoyi, Victoria Island, they're empty. The reason they're empty is because most people, most investors and most uh, consultants or advisors have not gotten to the place where they've become creative, they've become innovative, and they've started rethinking this box. Those empty buildings have a use, and it's only the investors who are able to apply this creative thinking um, in this new economy that will see those buildings actually put to good use. I imagine that we'll have an opportunity to talk about some other aspects, but I'd like to stop there just to make sure that um, I'm not you know, going on for too long. So those are the three points that I'd like to um, really mention, that framework of the GDP, which we use um, you know, across you know, for other businesses and business consulting. However, I'm applying it to real estate and I'm saying that that framework 
basically comes down to the bottom line, which is that we have to be creative and we have to you know, rethink the way that we do business. There are new opportunities and we need to tap into those new opportunities. The residential sector continues um, you know, to be an incredible uh, sector for real investors to actually um, invest. You know what, I just want to uh, say very quickly, there is a guide that you know, we uh, presented or we shared some time ago, and I'm happy to share that with you, Kola, if, you, if you'd like to share it with your, with yeah, your clients. Yeah, absolutely. You can send it to us, and it's, yeah, it's, we can share it okay. the link with, uh, with us. Yes, it's an astute investor's guide that you know, we put together during the last recession, and these principles are really timeless real estate um, investment principles. But if I just mention the first one, it says be recession-proof. And it was actually taken from a lot of the principles that Warren Buffett and some of the top um, investors, both in real estate and in, the, in, in other um, asset classes, be recession proof, befriend the market. Look at market fluctuations as your friend rather than your enemy. Profit from folly rather than participate in it. So instead of worrying about the market conditions, we have to look for new opportunities to create value for our portfolio and to profit while others are essentially frozen to inaction, making the wrong moves and all of that. So really, market conditions are largely irrelevant if your investment strategy is right. You know, we have to understand the market, know what the cycles represent, understand the opportunity in the particular target real estate segment that you're operating. Even in the commercial, um, there are opportunistic investors. In, in the last few weeks, we've received um, some inquiries that really appear to be very strange. But because of what we know, we know that there are always opportunities or rather markets within the market. I'll stop there, Kola. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Udo. Um, I always enjoy listening to you and your perspectives on real estate. Um, I'm going to come back to you um, again. Uh, but sure. I, I want, uh, we have the opportunity uh, to uh, really tap uh, Dr. Uh, Architect Danjo and uh, we lost him. I think he's back now. Uh, Dr. Uh, Architect Danjo, are you, are you, um, you can hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well. All right. Go ahead. Okay, so what I had asked then, and, and this is, and just for everyone to know, we're, we're getting these questions from um, the over 370 participants on this, uh, on this conference call. Uh, what I had asked then was, um, it, uh, someone was concerned about the length of time to process NHF applications. Uh, you know, we're talking about affordable housing here. Um, people believe that uh, NHF applications take, on the average, about a year. There's that perception in the market. It takes about a year to process. Is this the case? Um, and what are you doing no, about it, this? Okay, thank you very much. I'm quite sure it's no more the case now because we have to uh, had a retreat with the mortgage budget from the mortgage bankers, primary mortgage banks. They are the ones that uh, customers approach and they package the loan, then go to the FMBN. So sometimes it delays at the PMBs. And people assume that it is the FMBN that has delayed these loans. So that's why there has to be a joint retreat between the Mortgage Banker Association, the Real Estate Developer Association, and the Federal Mortgage Bank to ensure how do we reduce the turnaround time of our mortgages. We allocated time to every loan to ensure that uh, a loan doesn't take more than three months for it to be consummated and then paid for. Sometimes you'll find that currently we have approved a loan just of, uh, as of uh, the, within last year, we have approved a loans of over 120 loans, mortgage loans. But out of it, only 60, 70 million mortgages have been accessed. The reason is that some of the condition precedents to draw down by the PMBs, the ones to meet it, they could not meet those conditions. It's a problem between them and the developers in terms of perfection of documents and other things. So we have to create another option, that is the internal record office, IRO, whereby we streamline these things and ensure that uh, the turnaround time is quite reduced. Quite well now that most of the mortgages that we create, they are within the three months uh, maximum duration. Yeah. So is there, are there any specific um, new measures that uh, the bank is taking to widen the pool of uh, applicants to this um, to this fund you know are there new in I know I know since you've uh, taken over the run of that institution a, a couple of years ago we've seen an increased number of mortgages issued but are there new uh, measures that you're taking as an institution to increase the number of uh, qualified applicants for this I 
I'm sorry, sir, your, uh, your mic is on mute. I'm sorry, sir, your mic is still on mute, sir. Can you hear yeah, me? It's okay now. It's okay now, yes, sir. All right. I'm sorry, sir. It's going to mute again. It's okay now. Yes, it's fine now, sir. All right. Yes, we have to reach out to the informal sector that constitute over 80% of the working population of the country to ensure that uh, they join the NHL and benefit creation by have to create other products for those informal sector to benefit from, which is the corporate society housing development loan, which we have just created. It's a way of create and get a construction loan to build houses for the membership and credit mortgages under the NHL cooperative loans for them. We also have to, uh, we have reached out to some of the state that have not been contributing. They have now come back to contribute. And uh, the other thing is the option of we have to explore the opportunity of diaspora mortgages and the offshore uh, investment uh, uh, device in, in order to, even before the COVID started, we have reached out to some of these diasporas. We have been to the UK, we have been to Russia to discover these diaspora uh, organizations to see how they can benefit from the NHL mortgage loan, which is to do. Earlier on, you find that they send their money to their relatives to build houses for them. They ended up uh, sending the pictures of another site, not their own. So we, when we came back, we also invited the diaspora, Nigerian Diaspora Commission, uh, DG, who is uh, Ms. Adebe Dab Dabri. We've discussed with her and she has agreed to that. And we have given her a frame, framework on which we can now access the diaspora mortgages. We are developing that paper for our board approval. So these are some of the issues that uh, we are doing to ensure that uh, uh, wider pool of people now uh, are accommodated into the NHL. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, it's quite interesting that you note that um, you are uh, you know, targeting the, uh, the Nigerians and diaspora. Mm -hmm. Over the past uh, couple of years, uh, we as Mixta, we've done several uh, trips across, uh, across the globe and um, you know, a significant amount of Nigerians, they want properties, but it's, uh, it's obviously because of their income, um, it's, they have more stable income than those of us in Nigeria do have. So they always want to match that to mortgages. And it's something that I would actually look forward to. Uh, we've spoken to the Diaspora Commission, uh, Commissioner DG about this too. And she mentioned, she reassured us that there was something coming up in the works. So it's something that I know ourselves and our investors, our clients would look forward to. But one, um, one more question to you, sir. Is there anything um, uh, FMBN is doing from a technology point of view to streamline, um, to streamline these processes of loan applications? Uh, from our experience, uh, we, we started a project, uh, as you know, uh, it's called Mixtaflex earlier this year. We sold a significant number of um, properties and um, a lot of these uh, applicants are going through the process. But what we do find is that there's a disconnect between the EMBs and um, NHF or the, uh, the bank itself. So is there any uh, technology that you are, you know, that you're spearheading for the, uh, for the PMBs to come along with, or the PMIs to come along with, uh, to consider? Well, apart from the by, by man and the redden, we have uh, started developing uh, technologies through the uh, core banking applications which we are about to procure. It's already at the Fed awaiting approval, and once it is approved, it will go into our already existing Oracle uh, 12C application. That will be uh, going to lead us into even online applications by customers, even online, and then they get the applications approved, and then that will take care. It's going to quite well reduce the turnaround time by at least 70%. So instead of the three months that we used to have, it might likely come up to just 30 days within which we get approval of mortgage loans. We're also considering joining mortgages as long as they are legal couples. Like a couple can come in and then get a mortgage. As long as they are couples, they can be given this mortgage to, to improve open.
Thank you very much, sir. Um, one last question for you, sir. And um, again, it's, it's part of uh, the questions that we're seeing from our participants here. They, they have asked that, um, uh, what is the strategic intent of the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis endeavors of other MDAs? Given the Federal Mortgage Bank has been longer in existence, is there any collaboration between these different, um, is there any reason why this collaboration seems weak between uh, the Federal Mortgage Bank and other um, MDAs? And I, I think uh, to allude to what the participant is asking, uh, I think what we see uh, from our perspective is um, the Federal Mortgage Bank has its own uh, set of initiatives. Then you have different MDAs with different initiatives. At the end of the day, we're all trying to solve this housing problem, right? So how, why is there so much of a disconnect between all these different uh, or agencies? Quite well, uh, we have observed that uh, disconnect between some of the agencies. You'll find that uh, sometimes government uh, create organizations with, dupl with duplicative uh, roles. Uh, so with that duplication roles, you'll find that uh, uh, some organizations will be doing a role that another organization has already been doing. So if the government could not be able to come and then streamline us and ensure that uh, the two organizations are working together, things are going to get uh, very difficult for that. Just like the case of the Family Homes Fund has, been, uh, has just been created, which is there to provide a similar opportunity that we are giving, like the construction finance, they do mortgage finance, and, and, and those kind of things. So the, the need, you'll find that, if not because of us, the two chief executives that uh, decided to come and sit down and see how they can collaborate within themselves and then, and then uh, improve their own services by themselves. The government, institute, the government has never come forward to ensure that uh, the two of us work together in, in two. But we are making our own efforts to see that uh, Federal Housing Authority that is meant to produce houses, they now approach us to create mortgages for the houses they have built. Family Homes Fund that has built, that has given construction loans to those institutions, they are now coming forward to the FMBN to give the, the affordable mortgage to the contributors to the NHL that uh, showed interest in that. So as long as the government is not uh, has not come forward to do that. The two institutions might need to ensure that uh, they now streamline their own activities to ensure that for the benefit of the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I think it's quite instructive that you mentioned the Family Homes Fund. We've worked a lot with uh, the, uh, the group uh, led by Mr. Adewale. And uh, what we found uh, was that, yes, there was a, just a lot of um, there was a lot of disconnect between the NHF and the Family Homes Fund. Uh, but I think one key thing, and I don't know if you would agree with me, is the, uh, is the fact that uh, your fund is structured and it's funded, right? Um, how do you, is that, do you agree with that, that it's, it's a key distinguishing factor in terms of how to execute on how to offer affordable houses or uh, affordable financing for houses across the margin? Well, as you quite well, the FMBN is a, NHF is not funded by government. It's a contribution, it's a full of contribution by the contributors into the fund. And as long as it's their own contribution, mortgages has to be given to them as concessionary interest rate over a long period of time. That is the main essence and the, the purpose of even creating that uh, scheme in itself. So a scheme is created to, uh, to, to leverage or to assist the low and medium income earners who are contributors into the NHF in order for them to promote home ownership through the affordable mortgages. So that is the key distinction, distinguishing factor in it. Other organizations will find that they are funded by government, but NHF is not funded by government, but it's a pool of contributions in order to create a pool of funds for the benefit of the law and media who are the contributors to the fund. Yeah. I think you still have to answer a question, and uh, I think we're seeing a lot of questions from participants regarding when exactly uh, this diaspora program would come into the market. I think people are very interested in that. But uh, before you do, sir, I I'll just go over uh, quickly uh, to, uh, to Chinua. Uh, Chinua, uh, Mr. Azibuke, um, you know, I would like for you to speak more about um, the different cycles of real estate. Um, you worked with a lot of uh, uh, government initiation uh, initiatives 
to uh, resolve uh, this housing, affordable housing problems. From your perspective, um, how do you see uh, what uh, interventions that, uh, that, that can, what are the interventions that can be beneficial to the real estate sector uh, right now? Um, you know, and again, I, I would like for you to also speak from an affordable housing perspective, uh, keeping in mind that we also have uh, a lot of retail clients here that are thinking of buying homes and they're trying to make their decisions whether they should acquire their homes or their properties today. Where are we in the market? Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, okay. Um, uh, Sorry, Mr. Azubike, your mic once again. I think you have to increase it or move closer to your screen. Okay. C can you hear me better now? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, you know, affordability is a, um, it's, it's a moving target, um, a three-dimensional um, um, policy issue, which is basically driven by, you know, the, the, income, the income, the household income of the borrower, you know, um, the, the house price, um, and, and the mortgage interest rates. So these, these things tend to impact on um, how you define affordability. And um, over time, I mean, government has, 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 has initiated several interventions um, to attempt to address one or two or three of these components. And typically they either look at the, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the accessibility to long-term um, financing, which was why in, uh, the Nigerian Mortgage Refinance Company was established to promote access to, to long-term mortgage finance. Um, another was to also look at the, the interest rate constraint, which is what the NHF um, is, is seeking to achieve, provide lower interest rate uh, mortgages to, to address the interest rate challenge. Obviously, the one you can't really um, tamper with is, is, is driven by really the economic um, circumstances of the country and um, you know, general welfare is, is the household income. And that, that is really driven by by the growth in the economy. But also, I think of, through, these, through these mechanisms, um, the, you know, attempts have been made to reduce, um, improve access to home ownership, reduce the cost of, of capital, and, and increase access to, um, to long-term finance. Um, and, and I think still, till today, we still bandy this housing deficit of, um, of 17 million plus, um, which, which suggests that um, these interventions are working but maybe there's some, one or two um, areas that the market needs to look more intently into. Um, and I think, you, I think, I think to, to architect Dangiwa's point, you know, all these institutions can work together. They all, the, the market is, the gap is big enough um, that you can have multi-interventions, multi but there has to be a coordination amongst, um, amongst these institutions, how they, they leverage off their respective strengths and then they mitigate their respective weaknesses. Um, because not two institutions are not so perfect in, in, in certain markets. So how, how do we see intervention happening in a sustainable way um, or in a very impactful way? I think, you know, when we look at some of the constraints still facing the market, and I think for developers, one of your challenges is, you know, um, access to, um, to the, 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 you know, how do you access the supply side is, is, is affected by the infrastructure, the cost of the infrastructure, um, and also, you know, titling and registration issues. And, and these, these, are, these are issues that, you know, cut across it, you know, and, and, they, and they require a certain type of policy intervention to help reduce that cost. Um, and this continues to impact on, on, the, um, on the supply side, the cost of the supply side as well. So again, um, you know, how holistic can we look at the market? And, and, and what are some of the gaps we've seen that we think that, there, you know, there, there's some opportunity um, for, for institutional capital to actually play a role? Um, and so to your point, um, these interventions are in place. Um, and, and if you look at cycles, you talked about um, real estate cycles. I think um, Dr. Dr. Okonjo talked about the fact that, you know, and I, he also, re also re-emphasizes re the point that um, home ownership is, is an essentiality, right? So which means people always need to have homes. And so if you recognize that it's an essential asset, which means, you know, that demand will always be somehow inelastic, irrespective, it could just basically shift between classes depending on market cycles, uh, but there will always be a demand. And, and so for, for institutional capital, I would say that, you know, for those investors that hold long-term local currency um, finance um, and capital that can invest for the long term, it is, again, an opportunity to understand how best to take informed decisions 
um, looking at where the market is today. And so from our perspective at Infra Credit, what we've attempted to do is to uh, you know, engage with um, affordable housing developers to understand some of the challenges facing um, the market. Um, a lot of what we see is, is around um, you know, the liquidity and the accessibility of the financing. Um, how accessible is it? How liquid is it? And, and how can it be made affordable? Um, and, and I think you know, um, we, you know, a lot of what we're looking at currently is how we can bring actors together um, to work in a coordinated way. Because we also feel that you know, a, a bit of silo approach to solving the problem makes it more mm -hmm. difficult. And you have several actors trying to achieve the same objective in different ways. Um, and, and, and institutional capital would have a very significant role to play in helping to bridge some of these market gaps. Why? Because long-term institutional capital, um, especially intelligent capital, can come in to bridge market gaps with a good understanding of the market cycles. So, and, and it brings me to where we are now, which is we're talking about recovery. We're talking about whether it's a recession or a, 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 or, 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 or a depression may happen at some point in time. But the reality is that, you know, if you look historically at cycles, even though we know that this is an unprecedented situation and, and a lot of the recovery will be driven by policy actions, but certainly over time, we know that there's still going to be stepped up demand. And therefore, I would be looking at interventions that can help to bridge um, liquidity and provide accessibility for, for home buyers that are still willing and able to pay, um, take advantage of market prices for homes today, and be able to you know, step up at the point in time where market recovers. And, um, and I think you know, being able to look at mechanisms where we can leverage off um, those providers of capital that have um, that, that, that concessional finance, um, take advantage of, um, of developers that are able to produce or have already land, um, you know, um, stock of homes that are affordable and accessible and create a funding solution that allows home buyers to be able to provide ac access that liquidity on a timely basis um, that also is affordable and, and can give them that headroom that they require over time um, to be able to access market and create, um, a, I would say, a, a market. And I, I think I like... Um, um, Okonjo's point about uh, Dr. Udo's point about a market within a market. You know, we do have what we call a non-consumption market, and sometimes it depends on how you define that market. Um, it, it, the existing market that required a unique solution, and if we take the population in the country and the demand for housing, I think there is that market that can be that can be created within some level of efficiency. Um, and therefore, I think for for us, we feel that there is an opportunity. What we're particularly interested in in, in working with partners around is how to you know, how to evolve through the current market cycle and the dynamics. We need to create the right type of financial solution that can enable us sort of navigate through current market um, challenges and then sustain growth when growth comes, because growth will come. Um, and it's a question of, you know, who's that intelligent investor taking a view as to when growth would, would come and how you're able to create instruments that can enable markets to, 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 you know, to evolve through this cycle and take advantage of that growth. And so I think, you know, the, um, you know, so I think you know the, 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 we do have a lot of the solutions. Um, the, the, the local pension funds obviously have a very key role that they can play um, because, again, for, 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 for RSA holders, there's, there is a need to ensure that we can sustain those who are able and want to own homes um, and, and those who do have that, that, that may have challenges with jobs today but will get jobs tomorrow. Um, and how do we ensure that we can create solutions that can bridge market gaps and sustain growth? Because like you said, there are cycles, but the real estate market, the big challenge that has always been a common thread across is that access to long-term affordable liquidity. But there is still an upside. And there's an upside that the developers will tell us that that is why they're still in that business. There's an upside why Dr. Okonjo is so, um, you know, so bullish about real estate. And I think for informed investors to understand where the upside is um, and be able to create solutions that can create access, provide access for those who need it, and then participate in the upside, creating a more, more liquidity for a market, more efficiency and scale uh, for that market. Um, so, you know, I, I think working together, there are solutions that, that can actually complement, um, especially the interventions that the government brings in place. At, at the point the intervention is ready, there is the instrument to be able to absorb that intervention. So I, I think I'll highlight the fact of coordination. It's extremely important, especially for actors that also need each other to be able to, to be more efficient. Um, creating the right institutional structure will, ena will enable private sector to, to position themselves in a good, in a, in a, in a, with, you know, with the right type of instrument to absorb interventions when they come. 
Um, and, and that creates discipline across the market. It creates standards across players within the market. And when you have that sort of market discipline and standards, then capital comes in, in bounds and the market can scale. Uh, and and we, 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 we've seen this happen um, in other markets, right? And we're not, you know, it's happened in other markets and there's no reason why uh, we can't see the same kind of, um, you know, um, evolution happening here. Um, so I think for us, the question is, what, where is the opportunity today? Um, because again, what we hear is a tale of, you know, there's going to be challenges. Certainly there will be challenges, but there will be a recovery and the demand is going to come back because it's always going to be demand for homes. Question is, how do we work together to ensure that we can sustain um, constraints today and prepare for the opportunity tomorrow? Um, and, and I think there, 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 there are solutions that we can look at and um, because historically we have seen this happen successfully in other markets. Uh, the, only, the only caveat is, you know, policy decisions on how the government manages, um, you know, how the, how the economy is going to be restarted um, is, is very critical to, to ultimately, you know, whatever um, assumptions we make about growth in the future. Hey, uh, thank, thank you, uh, um, uh, I, I think what, what, I hear you, what I hear you say is that um, uh, for this uh, cycle of uh, the recovery to be beneficial to um, our investors, to the retail investors, institutional investors, and, and the likes, um, government institutions like the NHL, um, Federal Mortgage Bank, uh, FHF, the Central Bank, um, and other institutions have to work together. Um, we all have to coordinate uh, um, and attack this issue uh, together. Um, you know, I couldn't agree uh, more with you that uh, demand for housing is always going to be there. Uh, people need places to live. Uh, when you look at uh, the size of, I always take Lagos as, as an example. Uh, when you look at the size of the market uh, compared to, um, I, I believe the stats is that the, the uh, Lagos, uh, the amount of 60% um, of the economic spend of the country, at least 60% occurs in Lagos, right? Uh, but only Lagos has less than 1% of the landmass of the, of the country. So that tells you where the opportunity really lies, right? Um, and when we all look at uh, Lecky and BI and all the things that are going on, uh, further down Lecky, the refineries that are coming up, it tells you that uh, demand is strong. It's just what we all do um, as institutions to help uh, foster, to help finance, or to help people get onto that ladder. Um, I'm going to start wrapping this up. Um, we have a little bit over uh, uh, 15 minutes to go through the rest of the session. Um, so I'm just going to go uh, two questions to you, sir, um, Architect Dangura, before I uh, ask everybody um, a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned the informal sector. Um, and I do know that uh, you also mentioned that um, uh, your, uh, your fund is, uh, is funded by those that are contributing. How would the informal sector, how are you going to bring on board this large informal sector onto the fund and start lending to them? I've also heard a lot of PMIs uh, speak to the fact that they don't really focus on the informal sector. So I find it interesting that you as the market leader, you want to tackle that, that challenge. We all know that if we can bring the informal sector onto this structured uh, uh, ability to get structured finance, it changes the game. It helps with affordability. How are you going to manage that risk of bringing the informal sector on board? Well, thank you very much. The issue is that uh, when we realize that uh, currently we are dealing with the formal sector, we realize that that formal sector is constituted only 20% of the total uh, working population in the country. So the informal sector constitutes 80% of it. It's a huge market that we must have to see that we invest into. And the only way to do that is let's uh, devise some of the products that will attract them into, the, into it. We have products that uh, they can, uh, product options for either to buy or to build their own houses through indiv individual construction loan or through the cooperative loans whereby estate developers are invited by the corporate societies to approach the bank to give them a loan to build the estate and then we create mortgages for their members. We also have the rent to own where some of our funded estate that we already have, people even in the informal sector can key into it and then enter as tenants while paying their monthly or annual rental income of the house of their own. We have the option also renovation and renovation loans. So these product options are what we are now putting on board to see that we attract them. And the, the risk factor which you mentioned, 
basically is that uh, most of the self-employed will find that uh, uh, they earn more than even the employed people. And uh, most of them, as long as you key into, you, you, you bank your money into banks, you must have a BVN. So we are discussing with the uh, ADD automatic debit, debit uh, transfer, whereby the NIPS are ready. We have started discussing with NIPS to see that uh, as long as you, uh, you get our loans and you have a bank account, at the end of the month, whether you pay or you don't pay, it goes into a BVN and collect our fund our payment and then back into the into our accounts into our own accounts so this is a major thing that we have to ensure that for anybody that has to key in a self-employed and informal sector person then you must have an account with, uh, with any of the bank in the country and once you have an account you must have a, a bvn that is the major uh, consideration we made and it's a, it's a, it's a arithmetical which we are now trying to adopt currently Thank you, sir. So um, I hear that clearly, and I'm glad to hear that. I'm sure a lot of people are also excited because, you know, like we all know, there's a huge informal sector in Nigeria, and a lot of people have their businesses, especially even when you look at a lot of real estate agencies out there, uh, the real estate agency yeah. professionals. When we sell our products uh, as big stuff, for example, it's always hard to, uh, to understand that most of these guys, because of their uh, commission-based income or their businesses, they're not able to qualify for NHL. So we really look forward to this coming upstream. Um, when do you see um, the diaspora mortgages coming on stream? Uh, I don't want to uh, put any pressure on you or anything, but if you can give any guidelines in terms of timelines uh, that this will come on stream. Well, the paper has already been developed by the management, the bank, now awaiting our board approval. If not because of the COVID uh, lockdown, the board would have met and then approve that mortgage, uh, mortgage, uh, diaspora mortgages for us. And then once it is approved, we now forward it to our moral minister, who will now uh, put the finishing touches and then to to go into the market. So I'm hoping within the year this diaspora mortgage is going to take off. And as long as the diaspora commission are on our heads, uh, calling us most of the time to see that uh, they are very much interested in these diaspora mortgages. We are collaborating with them to ensure that this uh, diaspora just took off with the bear. So I show you that. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. That's, uh, I think that's very clear. I think uh, we're all going to be looking forward to um, a lot of uh, activities from your bank. Um, I, I think um, I'm quite excited to hear you mention uh, things like the cooperative loans, um, the rent own schemes. Uh, these are these are opportunities that for for the retailers uh, for the retail investors here, uh, they, and this is why we bring this the type of sessions to everybody. Um, you know, information might not be out there, but you heard it. Uh, there are these opportunities out there to uh, to get mortgages uh, either as a group. Uh, very soon, we'll be looking at uh, mortgages for diaspora, uh, the Nigerians in diaspora, and uh, and the informal sector. So I think this is a uh, quite uh, good news. Just to uh, take this down and to start shutting down the session so that uh, we can uh, release our panelists. In one quick um, answer, and I'm asking everybody uh, this same question, uh, this is for all the panelists. Do you see a market, uh, a price crash in real estate in 2020? Uh, Dr. Um, Oshikoya, can you please uh, go first? But I think the, those who are the regulators, the operators have spoken a lot about um, the real estate aspect of uh, this. Uh, but nevertheless, if you look what happened in 2018, 2008, when you will have the global financial crisis, the Nigerian stock market has not recovered where it was uh, as of now. It has not recovered. Time, real estate actually grew by almost 9% between 2010 and 2015, while the equity market was actually completely uh, stagnated or even went down. Of course, immediately after the 2015, um, in 2018, real estate also uh, went down in terms of uh, its growth. But I'm very optimistic that real estate will remain a viable investment option and therefore even if the price is going to go down 
it will it will it, it will not be the same as say for example the equity market which stagnated for such a long time uh, because real estate is a, provide you a home provide you a source of stable income your house will always be there even if the stock market crash so as a result even if the market prices go, uh, even if the real estate market prices should go down, I do not think it will stay low uh, for, for, for such a long time relative to, 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 to um, other investment vehicles such as equities. All right, I, I think that's fair. I, I, I think, um, uh, Mrs. Okonjo, uh, can you please just share your uh, perspective, keeping in, time the, uh, keeping in mind the time that we have left? Would there be a price uh, reduction? Are yeah, prices going to crash in this market uh, in this year? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I mean, I avoid using words like crash and those types of uh, very dramatic uh, language because we're very keen on always um, trying to inspire confidence with accurate information. So there will always be adjustments, you know, to reflect the mood of the market, to reflect the psychology of um, of the people who are in the market. So prices will definitely adjust, but you know, therein lies the opportunities. Uh, people who are trying to get into the real estate ladder or move up it uh, will take advantage of the opportunities that exist at this time. In addition, we have to remember that uh, there's a devaluation of currency. So for those who are in cash positions, who uh, their timelines as far as investment, obviously, you know, if you have money that's for short-term uh, needs and expenses, that's not money you're gonna put in real estate. You know, but if you have money that you've maybe put in savings, it's definitely been devalued currently. Um, you know, I don't like to get into the battle between equities and real estate, equities, cash or real estate, but certainly real estate benefits from two key things. One, the inflation. Um, it's a very good asset class to, you know, hedge against um, inflation and definitely devaluation for those who have long-term funds or long-term interests, you know, as... Um, you know, the earlier speaker was saying, if you're looking to buy a property that you have use for, or that is a long-term um, asset, you know, and you have uses for it, whether it's commercial, it's residential, or whatever it is, um, then definitely, I, I do believe that the opportunity is there. But to answer your question directly, yes, there will be um, an adjustment and, and a correction, and it will continue for, for a long time. Bearing in mind that the time frame, I, I just want to refer back to some of the conversations to just, you know, maybe because we have the uh, Federal Mortgage Bank um, MD here, you know, things like tax benefits for first time home buyers, you know, things like, you know, some sort of tax break. So I think we can take that conversation offline uh, beyond this, you know, call I'll be in touch with you because I think that, you know, stakeholders in this industry, there are things that we can begin to look at to actually stimulate at the market, you know, post uh, uh, COVID to ensure that, you know, this very, you know, housing, which is important, uh, we're not talking luxury real estate here. We're talking, you know, affordable housing and housing for first time home buyers and for people who are providing housing for people who, who do not have, um, you know, homes to live in. So yes, market correction, yes, you know, lower prices and yes, big opportunities in there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, uh, Okonjo. Um, you're right, we shouldn't use dramatic words like a crash. Um, it's, uh, we'll use more price correction. Um, I think that's, the, uh, that's what a lot of us uh, do nowadays. Uh, but I think it's gonna be limited to uh, different markets. Um, you might see price correction in the, uh, in the premium side of it. Um, for as long as the institutions, like if the government uh, does uh, do what the, um, they execute on these plans and make mortgages, affordable mortgages, affordable, um, available to clients or to buyers, I think uh, which that would help stimulate demand. Um, and because really uh, for us property developers, we've already cut our prices to like a bare minimum that you, you wonder why you're actually still in this business, right? Uh, but again, uh, it's, that's where we also recognize that the market really is. With the, when you look at the income profile of the country, a good number of people are within that uh, bottom to middle uh, part of the, of the pyramid. So we have to continue to focus there. Um, Mr. Zubike, um, uh, the same question to you. Uh, do, you see, do you have any uh, uh, contrary views to, to this general um, answer that we have? General answer that. I'm sorry, do you, do you see a price correction uh, going on in the market uh, this year? 
but we realized the market. So, I mean, what would happen is we're seeing, um, we will see um, supply outstrip demand, right? Um, that, is, that is gonna happen. And the question is how, how, um, how the suppliers of real estate will react to that, um, you know, to that um, mismatch in the, medium, in the short to medium term. Um, because demand will ultimately pick up. Um, but in the, in the short to medium term, because of the, I would say, the social and psychological impact um, that, um, that this, um, you know, this pandemic is causing, um, it's really going to impact on consumer behavior, consumer preferences over the medium term. So the average person is probably thinking of job security, um, savings, um, you know, um, you know, healthcare, um, and, and that would be on people's mind for the for the you know for for, for the near term. Um, but as 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 um, you know, as market evolves, we expect to begin to see um, stabilization and and the natural demands that people would want to own homes. So so there would be that gap, and I think it's just being able to um, you know to sustain through that that cycle, which could be again six months, it could be nine months, again. Policy decisions will drive this, um, but for for developers, it's really to have a strategy um, that enables you to um, go through this cycle um, because there will be demand uh, over time. So I, I just see this as a cycle. But again, the always caveat I put is about how the government um, manages um, the recovery um, ultimately. But again, I try to say there is a class of borrowers. It's just to understand your product design and for your market. And there are still those who can access homes. And I think there are solutions to enable those who still demand for homes, even during this cycle, um, to access those homes. So that's a sort of strategy that I imagine that, you know, out of the box thinking that, that developers need to put in place to navigate. But the market would ultimately is a resilient market. It is a resilient market and it will pick up. Um, so we shouldn't assume that, especially for those developers that have product designs that are targeted at, at unique markets, right? It, it, it's a resilient market. Thank you very much. I think that's quite clear. You said uh, supply will outstrip uh, demand. Um, so um, architect Dan and Daniel, just uh, the final question to you. Uh, do you see a price correction in the real estate industry this year? I'm sorry, sir. Your again, your mic, your your. Okay. Yes, your you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm foreseeing that uh, with the COVID, post COVID, there will be a conversion of the housing from social problem into social economic opportunity for the economic development of the nation, because it is one of the highest job creating sectors of the economy in terms of uh, as a catalyst for both manufacturing and uh, uh, financial services uh, growth in terms of that's what we mean. So it also helps easily adopt the new technologies in construction, finance, and other stages of evolution. You find that most of the developed economies build their own economic strategy around housing as a major pillar. Nigeria should also key into that. With the COVID, I'm foreseeing that uh, cost of housing may reduce due to the glut and due to the developers they want to sell their own products. And being that, uh, housing or real estate is a more viable investment opportunity and safer than investing in, in stocks. So people may likely convert their own money instead of investing in stocks that has already crashed into the real estate. So more people are coming to invest into the real estate, you find that definitely there's going to be glut because people are not, uh, are no more people who can buy. And then at the same time, the prices has to, has to come down. For, for that to, to be. So it's, uh, I can see there's a, a great opportunity for that. That's why I want to see that uh, these uh, public institutions, the government has to, or the public has to leverage on this public institution like the FNPM, FHA, Family Homes Fund, to take on the, to, to be, because they take more risk than the private sector that they cannot, uh, uh, that they cannot take. With that, you can find that we develop more of market than, than the other uh, sector that is the private sector. So we should do the same thing here with the Nigerian population increasing and think that with the glut that is coming, uh, houses will have to come down and then people will now own their own houses. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Um, I, I think uh, it's, it's quite, it's quite, uh, uh, 
forming to hear that uh, you say that um, uh, you're going to the public institutions are going to take on more risk uh, than the uh, like the private institutions in solving these housing problems. Uh, what we do, we look at it uh, at Mixta that um, the way we see housing at Mixta is that um, housing is, is, is like the bedrock of the economy. Um, housing uh, presents an opportunity for an individual to, uh, to build their own personal balance sheet, right? Um, it's for, the, for most people, it's the most um, expensive uh, expenditure they would ever incur in their lifetime. Uh, so the more people that have houses, the more stronger uh, the personal balance sheets of, of all these individuals of the country, which more or less translates to, to a better economy. Um, again, I would just like to, um, we, we're coming to an end, we've come to an end of this session. Uh, we really appreciate um, the, the time uh, uh, devoted to this. Uh, it's very, I know it's very difficult and it's very, um, it's very difficult for you to devote uh, two hours of your time considering all the amount of uh, work that we all have to, to do right now. But we thank you very much uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, we really appreciate your contributions. And for all the other participants that have uh, come into the session today, we thank you for taking the time to spend these two hours with us. And uh, from what I'm seeing here today, I think we might have to have another session uh, like this, but because it just seems like the time is not enough. But again, thank you very much, everyone. Um, again, like we all say, stay safe and please stay at home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jamil, thank you thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. All right, Tess. Cheers. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shikoria. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was Thank a really informative um, session. We've had feedback from people even now. Thank you. And it was much. really good. Yes. Thank you. Okay.